Welcome to The Stone Wolves, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins. Performed by Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves is also available as a Kindle ebook from Amazon.com or as a full length audiobook from Audible.com. To find links for those items, go to scottsigler.com slash the stone wolves, one word. Bonjourno junkies, this episode drops on Easter Sunday. If you celebrate that holiday, happy Easter to you. If you do or don't celebrate it, I hope you stuff your face with chocolate. And I hope you find all the hidden eggs so one doesn't make its presence known in, say, three to four weeks. I am 25% done with the first draft of Shakedown, the Crypt Book 1. I have six weeks to go on my June 1st deadline to deliver a 100,000-word first draft. It's going to be, I'm going to be heads down for a while knocking this out. So if you follow me on social media, you may have noticed a reduction in posts. I said I'm heads down. Were you not listening? I have pretty much no social life until I turn in this uh, this first draft, which is fine with me because I am focusing on keeping my focus. It's a double focus effort. Only three more Stone Wolves episodes after this one, so get your questions in for our world famous post story Q and A episodes. Email your question to info at emptyset.com. Feel free to send in a video question, but make sure it is vertical and keep it to under thirty seconds. That's it for this week's Jibber Jab. Let me get you caught up on the story, and then we're all going to go drop that base. Previously on The Stone Wolves, the killer crashed Thorn's party and has the Vermada operative dead to rights, but can he finish the job and put an orphan maker bullet through his bitter enemy? Find out next on The Stone Wolves, episode Number 30. Chapter 25. Destroyer. The killer's finger tightened on the trigger, but did not pull it all the way. What was he doing? Voices raged inside his head. Shoot the son of a bitch. You've done enough to him, you murderer. Kill him. Capture him. He knows everything. The killer forced the thoughts away. You, Thorne said, his voice echoing through the ruined factory. The man's right hand was centimeters from the handle of his weapon. The killer was surprised to see that weapon was an orphaner. Where did you get that? From an old null knife vet, Thorne said. It seems the nation doesn't take great care of its heroes. She needed the money. For a moment, the killer thought about asking who it had been, maybe someone he'd known from his days in the service, but he realized that he didn't really care. The past was dead, just like so many other things in his life, like his sons, his wife. The killer felt the rage bubbling up. This man was the reason his wife and sons were dead. This man was the reason Quentin had never met his own father. No, that wasn't quite right. The killer wasn't Quentin's father. Killian was. I don't think I can help you, Thorne said. The killer's eyes narrowed. What do you mean? Thorne slowly looked left, then slowly looked right, then back up at the killer. I didn't remarry, Thorne said. I have no more children. So... If you're waiting to see where my family is so you can murder them, too, I'm afraid I can't help you. The word slashed at the killer's soul. He tried to stop the memories of what he'd done that day, of the savagery, the brutality, but he could not. The begging, the beating, the cutting, the blood. The killer had done that. Not Killian. The killer the hatred in Thorne's eyes. The killer recognized that hatred, felt it himself, matched it. When you tortured me, when you ruined me, that meant I had to get this wonderful new body, Thorne said. Thank you so much for it, monster. Let me show you what it can do. 
We've been friends for so many years, Killian. Come on down from there. You murdered my family, and I made your wife burn herself and your son to death just to escape me. Don't you want to wrap your hands around my neck for that? Don't you want to hit me over and over again, feel me break, and taste pure revenge for what I did to your family? I know I want that. Emotions raged inside the killer. All he had to do was pull the trigger. But Thorne was right. The killer wanted to beat that man. Beat him to death, slowly, painfully. The killer wanted it. The killer did, but Killian did not. The rage lowered, faded, and then it was gone. Nothing but a memory. And, strangely, so was the killer. He was gone. Killian didn't know how he knew. He just knew. It doesn't have to be like that, Killian said. You're busted. You're not getting out of here. Put your hands on your head and get on your knees, Thorn. The hate-filled eyes crinkled. The man smiled wide, wrinkling a face reddened by the sudden cold. What are you going to do, killer? Take me to the authorities? Are you going to make me talk? I thought you and Redwire hadn't seen each other in decades, but it turns out you've both been watching the same bad movies. The dead sense flashed into sudden reality, all-encompassing, dragging time to a crawl. Killian saw Thorne reaching for his gun, reaching slowly, so slowly. Killian's finger tightened on the trigger. Finish the pull, and Thorne's head would explode. The man would die at Killian's hand, just as his family had. Because Thorne was right. Killian was a monster. He was a murderer. Even in the darkest of wars, a war crime was still that. A crime. Thorne's hand crept closer. In real time, it was a fast draw, driven by cybernetic implants. The hand wrapped around the orphaner handle. Slowly, so slowly, the gun started to slide from the holster. And even as this happened, Thorne's eyes, eyes burning with hate, never left Killian's. Maybe this was for the best. No more pain. No more drinking. No more drugs. No more of that bottomless, endless sense of loss, of having failed the people who depended on him the most. If Killian was dead, he couldn't miss Constance. He couldn't feel endless guilt for the death of Quaid. He couldn't try to endure the utter shame of Quincy being hanged. He would never have to learn if Janine had died. And, most of all, he would never have to face Quentin. Would never have to see the disappointment in his son's eyes. Never have to hear the boy ask, Why did you abandon me? Never have to hear him ask, Why did you leave us to rot in the sinkhole of McCovey? Thorne's orphaner cleared the holster. Slowly, so slowly, the barrel began to angle up. In the forever time of dead sense, Killian felt his trigger finger relax by the slimmest of margins. In this strange realm of utter awareness, would he be able to see the bullet coming? A flash of light. He thought the dead sense had blazed a new line, but the dead sense was suddenly gone. The light had been a laser beam. Thorne looked down at his belly, at the sizzling, blackened hole in his shirt. The orphaner slipped in his hand, fell to the wet floor. Another beam punched through his chest. Thorne looked up, his eyes meeting Killian's. Then he stumbled sideways, his feet trying to stop the fall one stutter step at a time. Killian glanced right. There, behind a lump of twisted machinery, black armor gleaming with wetness, was Aya Omiyada, 
standing on one leg, Viden's long blade in her hands. Aya watched Thorn shuffle stumble away. He started to fall, his feet moving faster, his steps choppier as he did, but before he hit the ground, he slammed against the green cargo container almost as hard as Goldman had. Thorn wasn't dead. He slid to the ground, turned slightly until his back rested against the cargo container. She'd hit him, twice, including once through the chest. How was he not dead? And why hadn't Skipper gunned him down? Aya hopped once on her undamaged leg, correcting her balance before she fell. Every motion brought pain. She adjusted her aim. She didn't want to kill anyone, but for this guy, she'd make an exception. Don't shoot him! Goldman from behind her. She heard him coming closer, his feet sliding more than walking. Aya kept the long blade aimed at Thorn. Goldman drew even with her. He wobbled, barely able to keep his balance. The orphaner bullet had punched through the robot and must have exploded when it came out the other side. The shards had hit his arm hard enough to penetrate the armor at his shoulder, his elbow, and the shredded biceps. His arm was ruined. Blood continued to drip from the areas his armor's black gel had yet to seal. How Goldman had found the strength to tackle her out of Thorne's grip, Aya had no idea. After that tackle, and the run and dive that followed, Goldman had lain there, barely moving. That was when four eye stalks had peeked over the wreckage. Only three eyes stared out, though. One of them was swollen shut. Beans hadn't said a word, hadn't made a noise. He'd had a weapon in his little tentacles. Viden's long blade. It was twice as long as he was, too big for him to use. But it was the right size for Aya. She'd heard that weird conversation between the Skipper and Thorn. She'd waited for Skipper to use that ridiculous gun and end this, but Skipper had not. Aya had aimed at Thorn, waiting quietly, wondering what came next. When Thorn had reached for his gun, reached so fast, she'd fired. Maybe Skipper wanted to die, but not on Aya's watch. No way. That's stupid, she said to Goldman. Let's end him, now. He knows about the Abernessia, Goldman said. So much pain in his voice. We need what he knows. We need all of it. Come on. We need to keep him alive. Keep him alive? How about you? You're bleeding out. Goldman's helmeted head nodded. Then I guess we better hurry. Killian stared out of the hole in the cockpit windshield. Thorn, on his butt on the factory floor, his back against the green cargo container. Aya. Standing on one leg, Viden's long blade aimed at Thorn. Redwire, standing next to Aya, his ruined arm dripping blood. Just behind them both, Beans, so small and fragile now that he was out of his suit. Killian heard a small sound to his left. He glanced that way, saw the quith leader sitting in the pilot seat. The leader's cornea was a solid pink. He was terrified. Are you going to shoot me now? Terrified but calm, not yelling, not begging, not making any sudden movements. This was a rational being who could see that any altercation would not turn out in his favor. Killian liked that. Shooting the leader was the smart thing to do. That's what the killer would have done. But Killian knew, somehow, that the killer was gone maybe for good. No, he said. We made a deal. You did exactly as I asked, which means you get to live. As long as you keep doing what I ask, until we get out of here. Agreed? Agreed. I am at your disposal. Killian took a quick look around the battered cockpit, trying and failing to not notice the dead murk bodies in a corridor filled with blood. 
Any chance this thing is still spaceworthy? No chance at all, the leader said instantly. The only way it will move out of this spot is if it is towed. Killian had figured as much, but it was worth asking. I need an oxygen resupply, he said. And do you have emergency exosuits? I do. They are stock supply on the CFT. We have them for all the major species. Even for Sklorno males? Ah, the leader said, looking down to the floor, at Beans, then back. No, I am afraid not. But he could use a Sklorno female suit, which I have. That won't be a proper fit, but it would keep him alive. That'll have to do. Get enough oxygen resupply for me and the two people down there in combat armor. Get an exosuit for the male Sklorno and one for the wounded human male sitting against that cargo container. Do you have a name? The leader's big eye looked at Killian, then at the pistol in his hand. Killian holstered it. Names might not be best right now, the leader said. But you can call me blank the nameless. A sense of humor in the face of a likely death. Nice. Blank, Killian said. You live up to your end of the deal. I will live up to mine. With the damage this beast took, what's the best way down to the factory floor? The leader glanced at the readouts. Side doors are non-functional, he said. Most damage is to the nose and the sides. Little damage to the rear so you can take the cargo ramp. Shall I lower it for you? I will then gather the supplies you asked for. Killian marveled at himself. Was he going to leave a Vermada pilot alone in here? Where there were undoubtedly weapons stashed? Tell me why you're working for them, he said. I already did, but will tell you again. I once flew for the Concordia military. I was discharged. I needed money. I was approached to fly this EFT offered ten times my normal rate. They paid me in gemstones, half up front, half when I finished, although they did not give me an end date for the mission. I am not in the Zoroastrian guild. It was just a job. As the leader talked, his cornea's pink slowly faded, from solid bright to just a few thin curls of color. Was he telling the truth? Killian didn't know. What he did know was that he was tired of shooting sentience. Do what I ask, when I ask, and you live, he said. Get the exosuits in a bag, and rations if you have any, and standard personal oxygen tanks. Make it fast, blank. Now, open that rear ramp. The leader did so. The 18-wheeler had mashed up against the mustard-colored cargo container, but there didn't seem to be too much damage. Whatever was in that container, and the one on the back of the truck's flatbed, Killian would have to destroy it. Screw Redwire's need to study. But first, Killian had to deal with Druge Thorn. The pain was already fading. Painkillers flooded Druge. Far more than were safe, he knew. He had two holes in him, after all, and if he could no longer feel those, then perhaps it was better to die of an overdose. He knew no one was coming to save him. Either the scientists and techs were dead or wounded, or they had fled, suiting up and taking their chances on the surface. The emissary was still in play, but with the project completed and Druge this wounded, the leaky had a chance to move up in the eyes of the broker. The emissary didn't need to kill Druge, just let him die. So close. So close. He opened his eyes. Goldman and the purple girl, near but out of reach. Goldman's arm. The man was in bad shape. The girl struggled to stay standing on one foot. She held Lulz's long blade, business end aimed at Druge. Above them and to their left, the ruined EFT. All around, the battered factory. It had been so clean, so organized, so on time. And now, like Druge, it was a ruin. Because of the stone wolves. As fast as he could, which wasn't fast at all, Druge reached for his orphaner, expecting the girl to finish him. She did not. When his hand hit the empty holster, he knew why. He dropped the weapon. It didn't matter. 
Druge was as good as dead, but there was a better way to end it all. A better way to move on to the next realm, where Savimli and Yazada were waiting. Oh, the painkillers. A mixed bag. Parts of Druge felt on fire with agony. Other parts felt fine. Just fine. More footsteps. Someone approaching from behind Goldman and the girl. Killian Carbonaro. The killer. No void cloak. A helmet with a visor, but no hood to hide his face. The killer looked old. Gray streaked his beard and his dreadlocks. No red lines glowed from under his skin. The killer saw something in the wet, debris-covered factory floor. He bent, grunting when he did, and picked it up. Druja's Orphaner. The bad script gets worse, Druj said, tasting blood in his mouth. Is this the part where you say a man like me doesn't deserve a weapon like that? The killer stared out with the eyes of a corpse. No, he said. It's the weapon of a murderer. If anyone deserves to wield it, it's you, Thorn. Druge laughed, a laugh cut short by a sawtooth slice of agony in his belly, dulled only slightly by the painkillers. I'm the murderer, he said. At the end, it seems fitting we both have one. Druge silently prayed. To High One, to God, to Zeus, to Tamilian, to any supreme being that might grant him enough energy to stand to tear the throat out of that bastard. The same gods who had let Druge's family die didn't care then and didn't care now. You're right, the killer said. What I did to your loved ones, I... Druge smiled. At least that didn't hurt. The factory and the EFT and even the sentience around him started to blur, to spin. You're sorry? Is that it, killer? You're sorry for how you crippled me? You're sorry that you beat my husband and child to death? That you smashed their heads together and splattered their brains all over me? The purple girl's face wrinkled the way one's face did when they heard something ridiculous, clearly untrue. She glanced up and back at Killer, as if expecting him to call Druge a liar. The Killer did not. You're sorry, Druge said. I'm not. I'm happy your wife and children are dead because of me. I've got nothing to live for, and neither do you. The Killer looked at the girl, then down to the debris-strewn floor behind her. A male Sklorno, right there. How had Druge missed that? Getting shot twice through with a long blade could mess with one's concentration, apparently. The factory walls began to waver, to sag, to swirl. These were some good painkillers. I've got nothing to live for, and neither do you. Those words made Killian think of Constance, of his dead children, of one lifetime spent fighting for the purest nation, a fight that proved to be a waste, of another lifetime fighting against the Kratorakian occupation. That, too, had been a waste. Nothing to live for. But was that true? He looked at Aya, saw the doubt in her eyes. She'd finally learned what a monster he truly was, Good. Everyone has to grow up. Without him, where would she be? Dead, most likely. Killian had nothing to live for? He could live for her. He looked at Beans, the genius creator who wanted to liberate his kind from millennia of subjugation. Without Killian, where would Beans be? Dead. Killian had nothing to live for? He could live for Beans. He looked at Redwire, the one who still believed, who was still fighting every day against the occupation and now against an even larger evil. Without Killian, Red would still be in the borehole and no one would know of Thorne's destructive plan, of the Ramada's connection to the Abernessia. Killian had nothing to live for. He could live for Redwire. 
And then, of course, Zan. Always Zan. A sentient who had once been a builder of an entire world and seen that world destroyed. A sentient who had gone from ultimate hero to ultimate villain. A sentient that was wanted by the entire Quith Concordia. Without Killian, where would Zan be? Dead. Killian had nothing to live for. He could live for Zan. Quentin had his own life. He didn't need the father he never had. Constance, Quaid, Quincy, and Janine were gone. Aya, Beans, and Zan were not. Killian would live for his new family. He tapped his ear twice to activate the Combud's full-range communication. Zan, do you copy? His old friend's voice came back instantly. I copy. Two bogeys approaching your location. One is the same EFT that lifted off earlier. It will be here within ten minutes, likely with fresh troops. The other bogey is bigger. I believe it is the skinless. You need to get out of there as soon as possible. Shall I start warm-up procedures? Ships inbound, fresh mercs soon to land. Yes, warm her up as quietly as possible, Killian said. Aya, are you still in contact with Peaches? The girl nodded. See if we can get my void cloak, Killian said. It's behind a boulder close to where the EFTs were being loaded. Redwire took a stumbling step toward Thorn. Killian put a hand on Red's shoulder, gently stopping him from going further. Don't touch him, Killian said. He's modded. No telling what he can do if you get near him. Red swayed slightly, struggling to stay on his feet. We are bringing Thorn with us, he said, malice in his voice. You hear that, Thorn? You're going to tell us all about the Vermada, the Abernessia, the Cruncher. Believe me when I say that you're going to tell me everything. Thorn gazed at Redwire, a dreamy expression on his face. The man looked high as a kite. No need for threats, he said. I'll tell you about the Cruncher. Just don't leave me here to die. Thorn slowly lifted his arms above his head. Killian leveled Thorn's orphaner, but there was nothing in Thorn's hands. The man patted his flattened palms against the side three times, paused, tapped once, paused, then tapped four times. He rotated his palms outward in three small circles, a motion made awkward by having his back to the container. The circles left streaks of blood on the rust-dotted green paint. Right behind Thorn's back, between his hands, a glowing blue line appeared, a vertical seam in the container's side. The sides of the container slid apart like two sliding doors, revealing soft, intense, pale blue light that reflected off the wet floor and battered machinery. Just kill him, Aya said. Just kill him now. Killian heard the fear in her voice and, for reasons he didn't fully understand, felt that same fear himself. A grinding, churning, primitive fear, the kind a small animal might feel in the millisecond before the predator's dagger teeth clamped shut. No, Redwire said. Don't do it, either of you. We need him. As the doors opened, Thorn rocked backward into the opening, but held his arms out in front of him, regaining his balance before he fell. Sitting on his butt, he grinned up at them like the madman that he was. This is the cruncher, he said. The inside of the cargo container was packed with strange, glowing, transparent glassine pipes and tubes. Rounded blocks, shapes that were solid and hollow. Everything seemed curved, not a straight line in sight. Thin threads, like the silk of some giant spider, connected everything, held all the weird elements in place. Bean said something in Sklorno, something about being astonished and mystified, but Killian didn't know the words. The containers don't hold cruncher parts, Aya said, that fear making her voice tremble. The containers are the crunchers. Thorn laughed, coughed. A bit more blood splattered onto his chin. My crowning achievement, he said. Times six. And now 
I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Killian glanced at the EFT, looming on his left. Two crunchers in there. You got three of them off planet, Redwire said. Where are those going, Thorn? Thorn started to shrug, winced, then gave up the effort. Screw this, Aya said. She adjusted the angle of the long blade. Redwire's blood-smeared hand shot out, grabbed the weapon shaft, and yanked it upward. High one, but that man was fast. We need to kill him, she said. Right now, before he detonates whatever that thing is. Thorn slumped down on his left shoulder. His insane, drugged eyes stared up. I already did, he said. That quote from Oppenheimer, or, or Vishnu, depending on how you look at ancient history, that activated the detonation sequence. I would have triggered it remotely or set a timer, but it seems time isn't something I have in great supply. I set up that triggering phrase just in case. Never thought I'd actually have to say those words. Don't bother shooting it. If you do, you'll be at the center of a crater some thirty kilometers in diameter. Aya backed up, shaking her head, pulling at the long blade, which Redwire refused to let go. He's lying, she said. Destroy it now, right now. Bean sprang up, grabbed onto the end of the long blade. He dangled there, little feet kicking. Don't! I think he's telling the truth. Shooting it could kick out an energy burst that would kill us all. We have to get out of here. The container started to hum, a whining, rhythmic, almost solid noise, like a damaged water pump just before the pipes burst. Back away, Bean said, his feet still kicking. Back away! Killian did. His feet pressed down on loose wreckage, but he couldn't tear his eyes away from the container long enough to see where he was walking. Everyone backed away from Thorn and from the cruncher. I'm happy, Thorn said, shouting to be heard over the growing sound. I'm happy I killed Recoil. I'm happy I killed Lulz. I'm happy Hopscotch is dead. I would have rather seen you die first, Redwire, so that the killer would know I'd taken everything he cared for. But, sadly, you'll have to die together. Killian felt a pull, like an invisible vacuum drawing him toward the container the force too weak to move him, but strong enough that he sensed it. Oh, sh 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 shock Bean said. Dead sense flared to life, more intense and powerful than it had ever been before. Time slowed to a crawl, but even in that tar-like progression, it still happened so fast, Killian almost missed it. The container and Thorn were there one instant, whole, solid, the next, they melted. They descended, vanishing into a new hole in the ground. Killian had a brief moment where his brain dug up a word he'd learned while on the keeling so long ago, on the fundamentals of astronomy. Thorn hadn't just vanished, he'd been stretched. In that fraction of a second, he'd been pulled like taffy. Spaghettification. That was the word. The world snapped back to real time. All the wreckage close to where the container had been slid toward the rectangular hole, then into it. Killian felt that vacuum pull again, but stronger. For reasons he didn't know, he tossed Thorn's orphaner toward the hole. The pistol flipped through the air, the path normal until it wasn't, until it suddenly accelerated and shot into the negative space. More wreckage slid in as if the hole's pull was growing stronger, expanding. Killian heard the creak of metal and the crack of composite. Directly above the hole, some twenty meters up, the factory ceiling dipped, as if some giant standing outside had pressed a pointed finger down on it. We need to get out of here, Bean shouted. Right shucking now! The anomaly will increase! This whole f f factory is going to get sucked in! 
the radius around the hole seemed to expand, drawing in more wreckage. The plexcrete floor cracked, pieces being drawn down. The ceiling stretched further. The bottom of that new stalactite ripped free, shot into the gaping space. The high-pitched sound of air shooting out of the factory. Killian didn't know how to process what he saw. Was this a goddamn black hole? He didn't know. What he did know was it was getting stronger, fast, more up than out, but soon it wouldn't make any difference. He had to act quickly, keep his people calm, and get them out of there. Zan, come in. I am here. We need pickup now. We'll be north of the facility. Still in warm-up mode, Zan said. Ten minutes until I can lift off. The moment I do, those patrolling EFTs will most likely come investigate. The fighters. Shucking hell. And were all the mercs gone? He didn't know. Killian had to keep his people together, keep them calm, organized, and ready for any threat. He kept backing up, staring at the impossibility even as small bits of wreckage slid toward the hole, slid from the place his feet had been only seconds before. Everyone, stay with me, he said. We need to keep together and get outside till Zan can get to us. It's exponential, Bean said. If we're on foot, we won't g- g- get a hundred meters before it's too late. Killian's back hit the smashed EFT. We can take the truck! That voice had come from above. Confused for a moment, Killian looked straight up. There, leaning out of the hole in the cockpit window, was blank the nameless. The truck! The quiff leader screamed. Maybe we can outrun it! You have been listening to The Stone Wolves, a GFL novella, written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins, performed by Scott Sigler. Follow Scott on Twitter and at Instagram, where he is at Scott Sigler, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves was directed by A. Sigler, engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2021, Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song Battle Cry by the band Super Weapon. 